the rise of the SME IPO and while there are some concerns linked to the kind of frenzy that we've seen on that side but you know you ask the question is this the new growth round is it? Well, uh, it was rhetorically, and I would say that uh, for a for a large number of startups which have access to funding, uh, I don't think this is the uh, growth round. But I would say that uh, there are a certain number of startups which uh, do find it hard uh, to kind of uh, access the kind of capital that say Lenskart would be able to raise. So in 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 that context. Uh, when you're finding it very hard to raise uh, a large round or you're not uh, loved as much, this becomes a very powerful way. Uh, and if you look at it, Sherry, the amount of money raised uh, last year uh, in uh, the SME IPO was 10% of the main boost. So it's rising. Mm. And uh, if, if in the last five years, if you actually look at it, the SME IPOs, uh, yes, clearly it's been a buoyant last five years and they've benefited from the liquidity that's awash. But uh, they've really been able to deliver much better than the main bourse IPO. Uh, so in all likelihood, we find that the receptivity to a company that's mm. typically if it's a startup or even with a slightly old school play, we are likely to see far better receptivity. And there's a deepening of the SME IPO. Uh, barring, of course, uh, anything untoward that's happening. And if the liquidity mm. was to continue, we would see this growing. Uh, it's not for everyone, but for a certain kind of, uh, I would say, startup, uh, this would be a very, very attractive way to kind of list and get liquidity for itself. Yeah. Well, speaking of receptivity and listing, Kartik, let's extend that to the main board now. And, you know, we do have a pipeline of uh, uh, celebrated names uh, looking at IPOing through 2024. But uh, uh, given where the markets find themselves, as well as where the large Indian startups find themselves and, and the sort of surround sound at this point in time, how do you see that impacting confidence and receptivity? I think... Uh... If I were the regulator, and it seems quite clear from some recent actions, I think they're a little wary after that first mini boom that happened in 21, followed by a little bit of a suppression of that market. In fact, that would be an understatement. Right? A lot of them got plundered oh. by the market for, for, for brief moments of time until they actually had to prove their worth in the public eye, in public domain. So uh, Zomato's comeback story is fantastic. The policy was out and profitable. Nika is almost back. Um, so the stories, uh, I think, are giving confidence, but I think uh, regulators vary about what they let out in the large uh, caps, per se. These are all large caps. Right? Anybody is a unicorn, and little more than a yeah. unicorn in India becomes you know, late mid-cap, large cap. And so there, I think there's going to be more scrutiny, I would argue. And you can see some big pullback as well. But if everything is clean and you have a shot at being profitable and it's not a messy cap table or balance sheet, I think uh, there's no better time in some sense. So recently I found yeah. myself quizzing the two big two big ed tech ones, uh, Upgrad and Eruditis. Uh, one of them is thinking of moving back to India. And they still feel two, three years away from their public issues at the least, right? I was telling them, mm -hmm. please hurry because then everybody can peg their value valuations to you guys because you're the leaders in the mm. market and we need to see that for a chain reaction to begin and i feel that's you know the analysts in the public market need to understand these business models not one by one but mm. in mass so i feel that's the main most piece and on the smb piece i feel just to add to what sajid said the one risk is that uh, in india the SME market is also sensitive to a borderline profitability mm. or a path to profitability. So it's not for most venture funds, venture backed companies which have not figured out how to turn profitable. Ironically, as a main boss company, you can actually go public if your business model is well understood, you're a market leader, and you're actually on a path to profitability. Today, uh, the Amnesty Universe understands that you're the best in class and they will actually back you in the markets. That is much tougher in the SMB market. So the SMB market is more, you know, relevant for someone whose uh, profitability slash size is a little considered a little less attractive to the venture mm. market, but yet can actually go and continue being profitable for five years or ten years after they go public. A lot yeah. of demand, in my view, I, I just a matter of mm. time, not if, but when these these all of these will list and create a very vibrant tech sector index in public markets.
We continue to be under-indexed on R&D spends, on innovation. Uh, as you look at the playbook building out, and you said that you know it is going to be distinct for India, I mean, how much of this is going to be driven by uh, innovation? How much of this is going to be driven by R&D and the moats that one can build on account of that? What do you see on that front at this point in time? Because we really haven't seen much change, even as far as the large companies are concerned, when we talk about spending on R&D. Yeah, that was an interesting finding uh, when we looked at the data and found that uh, Indian private companies uh, underinvest in R&D. And a lot of the lower numbers actually come from the private sector underinvesting, uh, which we've seen that in uh, the gross fixed capital formation side as well. Mm. And uh, it's actually fascinating the, how that battle kind of plays itself out. There's only so much that the government can do to kind of drive that. And in our view, uh, you won't get the next uh, wave of highly innovative companies if you don't invest in basic research. Uh, given the challenges around Indian academia, the, the, the mm. research that's coming out of it, we feel that there is, aren't enough institutions uh, and Indian startups and like you know, Indian corporates will have to kind of uh, invest. And until that happens, we're going to see very limited uh, sectors in which uh, space is one we are really seeing uh, a yeah. fair amount of activity. And uh, no doubt about that, uh, a lot to do with how ISRO has supported the growth of the sector. Uh, but barring that, we haven't seen too many other sectors. Uh, perhaps we'll see this in the coming few years. Uh, we haven't seen that. So to your point, yes, uh, I would say that um, it, the the intellectual property uh, 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 is, is an area where I think we could do far more. And I don't think we have seen that uh, yet. And it's primarily led by private sector under investing to a significant degree. Uh, you know, Karthik, uh, the two trends that we've, of course, seen uh, gather momentum and steam, uh, the rise of digital native brands and uh, uh, the share is up at 44% in uh, 2022 versus 25% in 2018. And the rise of quick commerce uh, emerging as a key channel for digital native brands and moving beyond the sort of uh, necessities, uh, which was the playbook when they started with. How do you see the possibilities emerge the opportunities emerge for both these spaces over the next, uh, you know, few years. I think we've been believers um, and observers of this, which uh, Sajid's uh, articulated well. But we've also been believers. We're also backing companies. Uh, um, I don't know where Danzo will end up, but we were of first backers of the space. But um, essentially, if you if you look at uh, the real long game in India, you have to buy into sort of emerging consumer behavior as opposed to like you know existing consumer behavior right so what i meant what i mean by that is if you look at the urban population today that has been brought up digitally native um their inclination is to be able to do all of their discovery sharing purchasing everything is uh, mobile first right or online first and i think that's that trend line has kicked in four, five, six years after access costs, after brand availability and penetration and consumer behavior sort of come together. So we always believe that mm. these things to come together take five, six years. You can't switch on a button and say, I'll spend a lot in 2017 and everything should have fallen in place. There's a time and a place for it. And I think it's beginning to happen. And the pandemic definitely helped uh, in driving some of those accelerations of behaviors. I would argue if the pandemic hadn't happened, we would be still two years behind or three years behind. So I think some of these have been driven by just incredible ease of access and a predominantly online purchase behavior accelerated by sort of the last three, four years uh, of, you know, both external circumstances and how India's youth is essentially driving a lot of this. Hmm. So the spending power with that particular segment of the, of the of customers drives both those trends, quick commerce and digitally native brands, if you ask me. It's not necessarily you and me necessarily shifting all our purchasing to that that format. We, because we've experienced a certain type of commerce and we're very familiar with our spending power in a different model of commerce. And I, I think the, the surging youth uh, consumption is basically driving this in my humble opinion. What could trigger uh, the return of venture? 
Yeah, um, I feel some of the tide is turning. Uh, looked at the Feb numbers and they're at 900 million. And uh, even uh, so, if you look at that kind of a run rate, we should start seeing it cross about, uh, uh, about 11, 12 billion. Uh, in my mind, I think a lot of it has been do with growth. Uh, and if you actually look at the slide after this, which you're presenting, uh, growth's really, uh, and if you tease it apart into early stage and growth, you would find that growth's really been the big sharp fall. And a lot of it is led mm. by really growth. And uh, growth's been sitting on the sidelines, uh, primarily due to the fact that uh, the stock market gave a lot of these stocks a beating. Uh, the fact that many of the multiple benchmarks that, uh, you know, comparison in the public market's been very low. So they're saying that, hey, if that is so low, then how can we give a high valuation here, which is mm -hmm. fair. But as the market kind of lifts itself up and uh, as growth starts seeing more compelling stories, they will start wading in. And I feel the Indian market should certainly go up from where it was last year. And a lot of it will be led by growth uh, happening. Um, and uh, when I say growth, it's 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 both uh, uh, early growth as well as late growth. Uh, and uh, while it won't be as buoyant as uh, uh, 2021, uh, that was an extraordinary period. Uh, we will see uh, some of the energy coming back, uh, so it won't be as much animal spirits. So I would say, uh, Shireen, uh, I would certainly see it, uh, you know, going back into say 12 to 14 billion dollars. Uh, that's that's my view. Uh, will it be as high as what it was? No, maybe not. But fundamentally, it's led to the led by the fact that growth investors have been very, very cautious, and uh, they yeah. now want to invest only in really good ones. Kartik Reddy, Sajid Pai, thanks very much. We will take a break. There's a lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a moment with more. Thank you.